This morning we are going to continue our study in, in Romans in chapter 13, and, and we're kind of parking uh, here. We, we were here last week, and, and we're here again this morning um, just because there's some, some things that we need to, to consider and think about, um, and I, I, I couldn't fit it all in uh, one sermon, so uh, we're here again this morning, so we'll go ahead and, and read the text again. Uh, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good. And you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And we'll stop there um, this morning. Uh, last week, we said that uh, Paul here is talking about the relationship that Christians are to have with those who are in governing uh, positions or positions of authority, um, and we're going to review uh, the three principles that that really should guide our thinking uh, as we think about the relationship between church and government or individuals and government. Uh, and the first of those principles is there is no authority except from God. Uh, the second is that the the government uh, should promote good and prohibit evil. Uh, and then finally, we said that Christians should be known for being good citizens. And so we'll kind of recap those. Um, and, and these principles are really universal. Um, we have to realize that, that the government that we live under is, is different than the government that uh, Paul lived under in his day. Um, Rome was... It started out as a republic, but it really ended up being an autocracy. Um, and we live in a constitutional representative republic, and so there are some differences. Um, but these principles really um, apply to any Christian in any time, um, any under any kind of, of government. And so the, the first principle, we said there is no authority except from God. Uh, and, and really the point here is Paul wants us to know with certainty uh, that God is sovereign over history, that Jesus, uh, that God is, is Lord over all of history. And he's going to expound on this uh, in Acts. We can look at Acts when he is in Athens uh, at the Aragopagus. Uh, I said that wrong, sorry. Um, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, uh, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent uh, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So there's some really important things that uh, Paul says there. Uh, again, uh, our God is, is the Lord of heaven and earth. And so uh, you may find yourself honoring a certain person that is in authority. In Paul's day, um, they were bowing to an emperor, um, but God is the one who is ultimately in control. God is the one who gives life and, and takes life. Uh, he determines boundaries. He determines the rise and fall of empires. And, and Paul says the times of ignorance are over, uh, that God commands all people to repent, and that would include those who are in those positions of authority, uh, that Jesus is the one that God has appointed his son, uh, he has appointed to be king of kings, lord of lords. He will come back to, to judge. Uh, and everyone, all of us, uh, will be held accountable before God. 
And so Paul is saying that God is, is never surprised um, by who is in those positions of authority. Uh, God is, is never asleep at the wheel. Um, but God is active in history that he is, is guiding, that he is shaping and, and framing uh, history and that he will see that everything works uh, according to his plan. Uh, and this creates really a, a difficult question for us um, because we, we want to say, well, what about evil rulers? What about those um, who are infamous tyrants uh, who cause so much suffering in the world? Um, and Paul would say that even in their corruption, uh, they are a means to God's end. Um, and that, that's kind of hard for us to, to wrap our minds around. Uh, but we looked at some of that last week and we said, remember um, in the Exodus that, that God raised up Pharaoh, even though he enslaved the Hebrew people for 400 years, that that was part of God's plan uh, to raise Pharaoh up so he could display his glory. He said, I've raised you up for this purpose. And so God, uh, in the Exodus, uh, we, we went through that um, account of history and how Pharaoh, uh, how God was, was showing that he has control, that he is in authority even over earthly rulers, um, that he defeats the, the false gods of, of Egypt. Uh, we talked about um, how Nebuchadnezzar, um, the Babylonians were, were kind of sent uh, as a nation and, and, and sent Israel into exile. And, and the reason for that, uh, we know, is that God was punishing, disciplining uh, Israel. And so God allows this Babylonian empire to, to come in, send them into exile, and, and it leads them to repentance. And so that was, was his plan for those people. Um, but what about examples outside of Scripture? Uh, what about more modern day examples? Uh, maybe uh, Hitler or, or Stalin, um, people like that. And I, I don't think that we can ever fully understand uh, on this side of, of history um, those whys when we ask those kind of questions. Uh, but I, I do think it is important to remember that just because God allows someone to rule, just because He allows someone to come into power doesn't mean that He approves of everything that person does, every action of that ruler. Uh, and this is ultimately uh, one of those questions of theodicy, uh, where we say, well, why does God allow evil and suffering in the world? And, and hopefully, um, as we have kind of walked through some of Scripture, uh, you have a, a better answer for that. Hopefully you're prepared to kind of respond to questions like that. Um, the biblical answer, the, the most simple answer that we can give is that suffering and, and evil are a result of the fall. Uh, that we are sinners living in a broken world that is um, under the, the curse of sin and death. And so the suffering that we see and experience around us um, really kind of gives us an awareness of that. Uh, very much like a, a symptom points us to a disease. And I've used this illustration before, but um, you can feel perfectly fine. You can seem absolutely healthy and, and have a tumor and, and not know that, not realize that there's something that should not be growing uh, inside of your body that is there. And, and you really aren't aware of that until you start experiencing, experiencing symptoms. And, and that is what leads you to a physician. And, and so... Um, suffering and, and evil that we see around us that really stirs up our desire for justice, for some kind of comfort, for some kind of peace or, or restoration. Um, and so then we, we long for that peace, we, we look for hope, and we, we begin to cry out for a Savior, um, needing, needing someone to, to remedy what is wrong with the world around us. And um, it's ironic that if you look at places where there is intense suffering or where there is intense persecution, um, the gospel is, is not stifled. Uh, it, it actually begins to, to multiply. Um, as believers are, are, are trusting God's promise to restore, uh, to come back and, and rule and, and reign, and, and looking at Scripture and what Scripture says about 
how finite everything around us is, how temporary everything around us is, and, and they're putting their faith that there is a God that loved us, that came and, and died for our sin, that they can have that relationship with Him, and that eternity is ahead of them. And, and so they, they put their faith in that, in the midst of suffering. Um, and I'll go off track here. Um, really, guys, that's one of the greatest obstacles of evangel- evangelism in America. Um, we have it too good a lot of times. Um, and, and so since we are some of the healthiest, the wealthiest people in the world, then God must be okay with me. God must, must like me. And, and the error in that, um, th- this is why it's so important that we, we talk about sin um, and the problem of, of sin uh, before a, ho- a holy God. Because we, we can't judge our standing before God on our circumstances. How, if, you know, if we have money in our bank account, if we're, we're in pretty good health, um, we, we can't judge our relationship with God on those circumstances. How we can judge our relationship with God is, have I trusted that Jesus died for my sins so that I can be forgiven of my rebellion against God? That, that's, that's where we put our confidence um, that's where we put our, our trust. And so um, here Paul is, is, is really saying, this is kind of cliche, but um, history is really his story. It, it, it's all about God's glory. Uh, it's all about Jesus' glory. Uh, and one day he is coming back as judge and king, and, and we will either be uh, confirmed as citizens of his kingdom or we will be condemned as enemies uh, who refuse to bow to Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. And so that's the, the first principle. The second principle we looked at is that government should promote good and prohibit evil. And so last week we said the government's role is really to legislate morality. Uh, and we don't mean that passing laws can, can change someone's heart. Uh, we said that's not what we mean by that. Um, but every law. Every law that is passed takes into consideration what is moral, what is right, and and what is wrong. Uh, And those in authority are are making moral choices. They're making moral claims. Um, And and so this is why we pass the laws and say, well, this behavior is wrong, so it should be prohibited or it should be punished. Or we say "This, this behavior is good, and so this should be something that we should protect and promote. We, we get that, right? Um, and, and so by thwarting and punishing evil, uh, those in authority, Paul says, are, are acting as servants of God or, or ministers of God. And so uh, we, we, before we got to Romans 13, we were in Romans 12, and we saw that um, we don't go after vengeance ourselves. Uh, we are not to exact revenge on people when, when they wrong us, but there are, are, are proper channels that we can take. And so uh, God has given uh, the sword to those who are in governing authority. And so it's, it's their responsibility uh, to punish evil and, and to pursue justice. And so uh, an example of this, and, and I guess this is kind of a, a negative example, but um, in Acts 22, when Paul is, um, there, there's a riot, and Paul is arrested and even in jail. Uh, he, he's proclaiming the gospel and, and people get upset. And so they talk to one of the Roman centurions and they accuse Paul of stirring up trouble. And, and so that Roman centurion wants to figure out why there's such a ruckus going on in ruckus. I said ruckus. Uh, why there's such a ruckus, I'm a redneck, uh, going on in, in prison. And so they get Paul and, and they're going to flog him. And so they... they tie him up and they, they place him in this position. The, the guard gets the whip out. He's, he's ready to, to start lashing Paul. And Paul says, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to appeal to the law here because I, I'm a Roman citizen and I haven't had a trial. And so it's not lawful for you to flog me. It's not lawful for you to punish me. And so that Roman centurion, he, he immediately stops. And the reason, we, we kind of look at that as the bad guy, but he's doing the right thing. Um, Paul says this isn't lawful. He appeals to the law, and that centurion stops. He doesn't flog Paul. He, he stops because he is 
pursuing justice. He's wanting to, to follow the proper procedure, the, the proper steps. And so he, he stops that punishment. Um, and the third principle that we looked at is that Christians should submit to those who are in authority over us. And again, we should have the reputation of being good citizens. Uh, I'll repeat that again. We should have the reputation of being good citizens. And, and the reason that I'm repeating that is not only because it's important, it's also so uh, nobody leaves here today saying, that pastor wants to start a revolution against the government. That's not my intention, okay? Hear me say that. Our, our default position as, as Christians should be to be good citizens and, and, and to not be troublemakers, not to um, stir up things, not to be militant. Uh, again, we, we talked about that last week, about how even though we disagree with abortion, we, we don't go bombing abortion clinics. That's not the proper response. There are, are channels that we can try to get legislation changed. We can uh, speak out against things that we don't agree with. We, we don't take matters into our own hands. And so that's very important that we get that. Um, but it is also uh, important to realize the, the specific words that Paul used here. Um, he, he doesn't say, guys, obey the government. He doesn't say to, that we should have blind obedience to the government. But he uses the word submit, and that's going to be our, our kid's word for the day. And, and so to submit, I, I said it's to be inclined to listen, yield or defer out of respect, affection, or persuasion. And so you parents may have to kind of talk to your kids uh, about some of those words and, and what those mean. Um, but here's, here's kind of an example for kids. Um, if you're with a group of friends and, and they're gathered around you and you're playing another friend at a game of checkers, okay? And, and so you're about to move one of your pieces and one of your friends kind of looks and leans over your shoulders and says, and says wait, don't, don't move that piece. Um, look again. There's something that you're missing. You, you don't have to listen to them. Um, if you just listen, that would be obedience. But since you know that when I... Let's say his name's Tom. When I play Tom, Tom always beats me at checkers. He's really good at checkers. He knows what he's talking about. And so since he suggested that I, I wait and kind of look things over, I'm going to defer to him. I'm going to, to take his advice into consideration. And I'm, I'm going to look again and, and, oh, there's a move where I can jump this piece and I, I'm, I'm going to be able to get my queen the next time it's, it's my move. And so that is kind of that attitude of, of submission. It's, it's being willing to listen to someone else's counsel, um, to their instruction. And, and so for adults, I have another example for you. Um, th this is the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 5. Uh, the Greek is hapotasso. And, and it does mean to, to be subject or submit. Uh, and so he'll say things like this. Believers, we should submit one to another, right? And then he goes on later and says that wives should submit to your husbands, okay? And maybe some of you have alarm bells going off when I, I just even said that sentence. Um, if you want an in-depth look at that, please go back and watch um, the series in Ephesians that we did. We, we talked in-depth uh, about uh, this relationship between husband and, and wife. Um, but again, Paul is not talking about obedience here. He's talking about submission. And so I'm going to carry this example out a little bit further. He doesn't say, wives, obey your husband, that their word is law, um, that they rule and reign. Um, he isn't saying uh, that you should conform or comply to whatever orders they bark out. Um, submission is a voluntary willingness to yield to another to allow them to Take the lead. Um, and so this doesn't mean that you, you don't ask questions. It doesn't mean that you don't offer suggestions. Uh, it doesn't mean that you remain silent if your husband is making bad choices. Um, that, that's not what this means. 
Uh, in fact, the passage goes further on to, to talk about husband's, a husband's responsibility to his wife is to uh, love his wife as Jesus loves his church. Um, and, and that means that we should always have her best interest in mind. And so if, if my wife has insight that I don't, I, I value her wisdom. I appreciate her, her concerns, her voice. Um, it, she is cooperating with me uh, to do what is best for us. And so that, that's that idea we saw in Ephesians is, is that we're one flesh. And so that selfish attitude of I'm going to do what's best for me is now replaced with we are going to work together to do what is best for us. Uh, again, go back and look at that. But the reason I kind of chased that um, rabbit trail a little bit is because the, this is a, a similar kind of relationship that we have with, with government. Um, Paul is not saying that we should practice blind obedience, uh, but he is saying that we should be inclined to yield, to defer to those who are in authority over us because they should have our best interest in mind. That, that, see how that's kind of similar. Um, and so now we can get to the, the next question. Okay, what if those in authority don't have our best interest in mind? What if they begin promoting evil and prohibiting good. Um, Paul does not directly address that here. Um, but what we see is it, when we look at the full word of God, when we look at the entirety of Scripture, that there are some biblical responses that serve as models for us to follow. Um, and so we can kind of break these down into to two categories. Um, of passive responses or active responses. And I stole those two categories from Bauckham. Um, but the first passive response is to simply pray for those who are in authority. And so we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1-4, through 4, it says, First of all, then I urge that supplications, and this is Paul writing uh, again, so... Uh, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so... How can we pray for those who are in authority? I have three ways um, that I've thought of. Uh, the first would be that they would repent and believe the gospel. Um, and, and the reason we have to put it like that is because we don't know the hearts of those who are in those positions of authority, right? Um, really, the only time we, most of, most of the time, uh, the only interaction we have is maybe when they're on television, when they're on a platform, a stage and they're giving some kind of speech. And so we should always pray that if they have not heard the gospel and re repented and, and trusted Jesus to be their Savior, that they would, would do that. Um, so we pray that they would hear and, and trust the gospel. Uh, second, uh, we can also pray that they would be, uh, there would be godly counsel around them. Maybe they aren't a believer but maybe someone that is in their group of people that surrounds them, that gives them advice, that they use as a, a soundboard. Um, maybe that person is a believer. And so we, we would pray that God would surround that uh, person with, with godly counsel, that someone would be there to be able to advise them uh, based on God's truth and God's authority. Uh, then thirdly, uh, the last way that we can pray, uh, maybe they aren't a believer. Maybe they are doing harm. Um, then it's it's okay, guys, to, to pray that God would remove them from their position of authority. Uh, we've talked about that, especially when we, we do our uh, International Day of Prayer and talk about the voice of the martyrs. Um, as these people are suffering intense persecution, one of the things that we pray for is that if, if God uh, doesn't change their heart, if they, if they don't repent and believe the gospel, um, that God would remove them from that position, position of authority uh, as a way of, of protecting those um, that are being persecuted and, and maybe easing up some of the restrictions and, and some of the, 
the things that they are facing in their country. Um, and so that's really, really kind of the purpose for the, the imprecatory psalms um, where we would pray, God, if, if they won't bow the knee to you, then break their teeth, um, humble them before you. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, if they are truly committing atrocities um, and persecuting those who are, are believers. Um, the second passive response, so we can pray for them. Uh, the second passive response is that you and I can can model godly morals to those in those uh, positions of authority. And so in, in Matthew 5, we, we think about when Jesus is talking to his disciples and, and he says, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth. And, and we've heard that this morning, uh, Courtney was sharing in Sunday school about how people are, are watching us. They're, they're looking at our lives um, that, that's how some people are introduced to the gospel is just by watching how we respond, how we conduct ourselves uh, in our day-to-day -day affairs. Uh, and so people are watching our social media posts. Uh, they're watching and listening as we have conversations. They're, they're watching our, our work ethic. Um, all of these things uh, are actions, and it speaks volumes to those who are listening and, and watching from outside. And so um, when we have conversations, when we post things on social media, um, it's important that we don't resort to insults and, and name calling, um, those kind of things, but that we speak the truth in love, that we uh, are wise as serpents and, and gentle as doves. Um, and so uh, I, I spoke about abortion last week. I've already referenced it again this morning. Um, I, I want to follow that up, but um, guys, we, we should not just be a, against abortion, uh, but we should also show the world that we are willing to support single mothers, mothers who are having uh, trouble making ends meet, that we are willing to adopt and foster uh, children that, that don't have families. They, they not only need to see what we are against, but what we are for, what we are promoting, what we are willing to um, put our money down and sacrifice to to help people because they they are important and it's not just important that that life is born but it's important that that life has a a, a healthy uh, life that they are supported that they are loved by somebody that they have uh, a relationship uh, and, and so we need to to support um, those kids and those mothers and, and that is a simple way that we can model for people godly morality that that uh, we put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. And, and so those children and that mother is important. They are image bearers of God. And, and so they do need our, our love and support because they're precious. And so those are the, the two passive responses. Um, and they should be part of our, our spiritual DNA. And, and what I mean by that is this: those two things that I, I just talked about, praying for our leaders, modeling morality, um, that should not be something that we pull out every now and then when things start going downhill. That should be part of who we are every day because Jesus has, has changed us. And, and so that should kind of bleed out uh, of who we are. Um, and so these things aren't things we wait to implement. Uh, we should always be praying for our leaders. And it, you can say amen or you can say ouch. Because this week I said, ouch, because I, I, I'll confess, I, I don't do that as much as I should. Um, but we should always be praying for our leaders. Um, we should always be modeling to others that that's part of discipleship. Um, that's part of our great commission. Um, and so along with those uh, two passive responses, there are also some, some active responses that we can implement um, and the first act of the response is we appeal to those who are in authority. So if we find that authority is um, promoting evil and prohibiting good, the, the, one of the active responses we can do is appeal to those in authority. And, and we do that respectfully. And we do that by the means that that authority has made for us to, to have an appeal. Um, we looked at the First Amendment last week. Um, 
the last part of that amendment says that we have the right in America uh, to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And so that appeal process is actually in the Constitution. And so we can make those appeals as uh, Americans. Um, we, we see that kind of appeal in Scripture as well. Um, Moses, going back to Exodus, uh, Moses appealed to Pharaoh before every one of the, the plagues uh, to, to let God's people go. Uh, in the book of Daniel, while Daniel is in Babylonian captivity, uh, he appeals to the chief unit um, because they wanted to, to feed Daniel the, the Babylonian diet, and there were some restrictions based on Jewish law, and, and Daniel did not want to defile himself with the Babylonian diet, and so he said, just feed me vegetables and water. Uh, and, and so he, he made an appeal to that governing authority and said, listen, I, I don't want to defile myself with that. Just just feed me vegetables and, and water. And, and they did. Uh, they tried that out and it worked. And, and so that appeal was successful. Um, the Apostle Paul, when he is standing before Felix, again, uh, it seems like everywhere, everywhere Paul went, there was a riot. Um, people did not like him. And people did not like the, the gospel being preached. And so he's standing before Felix and he says, listen, I, I know they've accused me of defiling their temple. Uh, that the Jewish high priest had accused Paul of, of coming into the temple and defiling the temple. And he appeals before Felix and he says, I, I'm not guilty of this. I'm, I'm innocent of these charges. And so he talks to Felix and Felix says, OK, I'm not going to do anything right now. Let me think about this. And so he goes uh, away. And so those appeals in Scripture, they, they often work um, in our context. Again, we have that ability to, to make those appeals. And there's several different ways we can do that. Um, we can, we, I, I guess we don't really use written letters as much, but we can send emails or, or written letters to congressmen, uh, to those who are representing us um, in the government. Uh, we can also uh, make those appeals at election time and, and exercise our, our right to vote. Um, and then along with those letters, you know, it, it, not just writing letters to say, hey, change this, um, but it's also good to, if they're doing something right, to say, hey, I, I appreciate you um, taking this stand uh, with, with what's going on here. I, I appreciate the good work that you're doing and, and sending them uh, encouragement uh, for supporting biblical morals. Um, and, and see... The thing is, we, we don't jump right to revolution. We don't jump right to, to taking up arms. That's, that's not our uh, approach. Uh, there are steps that we can take and, and steps that respect and honor those people that God has placed in authority. And, and that's the thing we can't forget. Um, the second active response is we can confront authority. And again, we see biblical examples of this. Um, think about when Nathan uh, confronts David, King David, right? So this is a big deal. Uh, Nathan confronting King David about his sin with Bathsheba. You remember the story? He's talking about someone went and stole a lamb, and the owner loved that lamb. And David says, they need to die. And, and Nathan says, you are that man. That's what you've done, David, by com committing adultery with, with Bathsheba. You, you've sinned against God. Or, or in the New Testament, you think about John the Baptist, right? When, when John the Baptist goes before King Herod and he says, it's not lawful for you to marry the wife that your, your brother had. You've married your brother's wife and, and this, is, this is not right uh, before God and, and God is going to, to judge you in this. Um, and what's important here, guys, is the further we go down this list of active responses, there, there's a trend, Right? It, it, there's more danger. There's a threat to the person that is confronting. Because it, it, if you remember those two stories, King David, he, he repented, right? He repented before God. against God against you and you only have I sinned. And King Herod, not so much. He took John the Baptist's head. He took his head. And so uh, we, we have to realize that that the further we go down this list, it, it may cost us something. And so that's very important. Um, right now, we can speak out against things. On, on social media, we, we might get censored or we might get 
unfriended or, or something like that, but that's, that's really the most that, that kind of happens. Uh, we're very fortunate in America, uh, especially when compared to other countries. <coughs> and I'll talk about that more here in a minute. But this leads me to our next active response. Um, There may be a time when we must defy those who are in authority. And again, we see examples of this in Scripture. Um, I've said Exodus a lot. We think we're studying Exodus. But go back to Exodus. And when the Pharaoh says, "I I want all of the Hebrew boys thrown into the Nile River, just drown them. And the Hebrew midwives say, no, we're not going to do that. So they begin making up excuses and say, you know, we were going to throw them in the Nile, but the birth happened before we ever got there. And so they defy that government authority. Uh, Think about Daniel when uh, the king says, okay, I'm, I'm going to enact this law. And the only person that you can pray to is me can't pray to any other god. You can pray to me. I'm the king. Um, you, you pray to, to how I want you to pray. You're forbidden to pray to any other god. And so Daniel says, I can't do that. I, I, I've got to pray. This is, this is the one true God. And, and I'm going to pray to him. And so he gets caught, right? He, he's defying that authority. But he gets caught and he ends up getting thrown into the lion's den. So again, there's a cost with that. Uh, What about Peter and John in Acts chapter 5 when um, they've already been they've already been imprisoned for preaching. Right. And and so they God miraculously delivers them from prison and come to find out they're they're right back at it. They're they're preaching again. And the, the authorities come and said, you know, I thought we told you guys to shut up. I, I thought we, we told you to stop. And they said, you, you did. But we must obey God rather than man. And that, guys, is the key to this. That, that's why our default position is we're, we're good citizens. We're, we're submissive to those who are in authority over us. But when that authority says you must do what God has prohibited or you can't do what God has commanded, then, then we have allegiance to God that is higher than our allegiance to any governing authority here on earth. Um, And and that's where that accountability and responsibility to our Creator must take precedent. And so every year we observe that International Day of Prayer for the the persecuted church. Uh, And these are men, women, and children um, who are often shamed in their communities, they're often imprisoned, Some, many of them enslaved, um, running in uh, concentration camps, those, those kind of things, um, slave labor. Uh, some of them are, are even martyred for their faith. They're meeting in, in secret to worship by candlelight. They're hiding and burying pages of the Bible because in their country it's, it's illegal to own a copy of God's Word or even a, a portion of that. And we've, we've heard those stories. We, we've seen um, testimony, heard testimony from people that are, are living under that kind of intense persecution. And many of them leave their, their homes to, to try to find refuge, um, someplace where they can worship freely, where there's more safety, less restrictions. So that brings us to our our final response. And sometimes we may have to flee ungodly authority. Um, Paul did this. Um, He was often kind of chased out of the towns where he was preaching uh, as people tried to have him arrested or or they tried to stone him. Um, And and so we see that when we read uh, the letters of Peter. He's writing to the diaspora. And that's the the ones who have been scattered because of persecution against Christians. Um, And so again, as we we move down these responses, there's this sense of danger, a threat of danger. And um, I I hope that we never experience that kind of persecution here. Uh, And and we must pray and continue to lift up our our brothers and sisters around the world that, that 
this is part of their daily life. We don't ever want to forget that, and, and we want to lift them up, that God would strengthen them, encourage them, give them peace, that he would protect them, uh, all those things. But if we are ever faced with that, guys, I, I pray that we would stand. I, I pray that we would stand on God's word. If, if, if ever there is a line drawn in the sand, um, I hope that we'll, we'll stand, that, that God will give us courage, that he will give us endurance, uh, and peace when that if that happens uh, and so I'll close by going back to our context in, in Romans and, and this hit me hard this week um, guys Paul gave his neck to the sword that God gave Nero to bear that, that's a sobering thought Paul endured and, and kept his faith and I'll close here and the reason he did that because he was absolutely sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's where his confidence was. So we pray for those around the world that they will have that same confidence and God's promises um, that this world is, is not our home, that this is all temporary, that we are citizens of another kingdom. And one day, Jesus is coming to, to, to rule and to reign. And uh, wow, I can't imagine uh, what that's going to be like. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word and uh, God, how it challenges us how it encourages us in our walk with you, how you instruct us in, in our relationships with other people and, and even those who are in authority. So, um, God, first of all, I, I just want to pray that uh, that we as a body here would have the reputation of, of being good citizens that contribute to society that are full of love and compassion uh, that you would help us to, to be lots to our community, our friends, our, our neighbors, our co-workers, um, that you would guide our, our conversations and uh, our actions. And then, God, we, we do want to lift up our, our leaders of this country that uh, we're so fortunate to live in. God, that uh, if one of those leaders don't know you, that they would hear the gospel and that they would repent of their sin and they would trust you as as savior um, god we pray for wisdom and guidance and direction for our country um, that you would just surround them with people that would be a, a positive soundboard that would give them godly counsel based on your word not not feelings not um what's popular but your standard of of truth and righteousness and God, we, we pray for our, our persecuted brothers and sisters um, that are under persecution, that are suffering, that, that have sacrificed um, because of their faith. God, we lift them up to you and uh, ask that you would comfort them, that you would give them strength, that they would know the depth and fullness of, of your love for them. And uh, God, we just thank you for all that you do for us. And uh, most of all, thank you for sending your son to die so that we could be forgiven, so that we could know you and have that relationship with you. God, be with us as we uh, uh, turn the page to a new year. Um, be with our, our church body as we try to evangelize, as we try to reach out into our community. Um, God, we just pray that you would continue to strengthen us, mature us in our walk with you, um, and then God, just multiply us. That's what we, we want is to see more people uh, come to know you and, and be able to gather here to worship you together. And uh, so we just thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.